say that the greatest teacher is called experience. It doesn't matter how many academic degrees you have. If you don't have experience, then you are only living in the theoretical world. In our lives, the Lord often allows us to go through a wide variety of experiences to teach us lessons. They are not all wonderful experiences. Many of the experiences we go through are quite difficult. But we only learn those lessons that a God-led experience teach us when we stop complaining about having to live through them. When we have an attitude of acceptance, then it would serve us well. As we've mentioned, our lives are filled with messiness. Our families are dysfunctional. And often we can't do anything about it because, as you know, we can't choose family. But we can certainly look for lessons, spiritual or otherwise, that God is trying to teach us as He allows us to go through a wide variety of experiences. And so we continue our sermon series entitled Home this morning as we look at the life of Jacob. And now we come to Genesis chapter 29. And so if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 29. We're going to go through these first 30 verses of Genesis 29 and look to see five types of experiences that the Lord allows Jacob to go through and then extrapolate the lessons he is to learn that we are to learn from a similar experience we go through. And these five types of experiences are not the be-all, end-all. There are a lot more But as we look to see how experiences can teach us lessons, biblical lessons, then I know that whatever we go through, we will be able not only to see the silver lining in what we go through, but be able to see the lessons that God desires to teach us. And so we come now to Genesis chapter 29, we begin in verse 1. So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. As you remember, Jacob is running away from home because his brother Esau is wanting to kill him. And Esau wants to kill Jacob because Jacob deceives his father Isaac and takes the blessing of the firstborn. Jacob now arrives in the land where his parents have told him to look for his uncle Laban, a place of safety. The distance traveled is about 450 kilometers And if we assume that he walks about 30 kilometers a day, that's about 15 days or a little bit more than two weeks of walking. Look at verses 2 to 6. And Jacob looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. And Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. And he said to them, Do you know Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said to them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Jacob sees a well where there are three flocks of sheep, about a hundred or so, and they're accompanying shepherds waiting for the well to be uncovered so that they can give water to the sheep. There was apparently a very large stone over the mouth of the well, which unless moved, they could not access the water. Jacob finds out that he is in the land of Haran, which is where his uncle Laban is from, who Jacob is looking for. And they tell Jacob that Laban's daughter Rachel is coming with her sheep soon to the well. And look what Jacob says in verse 7. And he said, look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. While waiting for Rachel to come, Jacob suggests that those shepherds who are waiting to water the sheep, that they should go and just move the stone and water their sheep right now because there would be other animals that would gather like the cattle and their handlers. And Jacob was proposing that they do something now instead of waiting around 
Look at their response, verse 8. But they said, we cannot until all the flocks are gathered together. And they have rolled the stone from the whale's mouth. Then we water the sheep. Notice what they said, their response. We've got to wait for everyone. We have to wait for all the shepherds who usually let their sheep drink from here. We've got to wait for them to arrive. So that they can push the stone. So they can open up the well for the water. Now you may be asking, is the stone that heavy that it takes a lot of people to push the stone away? The answer is no, because later on we're going to see that Jacob alone is able to do this. But Jacob, for whatever reason, cannot figure out why they won't do what needs to be done. Why are they waiting around? What Jacob is encountering here, number one, is this. The experience of meeting people with a different outlook in life. Number one, if you're taking notes. The experience of meeting people with a different outlook in life. This is one of the type of experiences we encounter. We meet people who are different from us, who are unlike us. They do things very differently. Perhaps they are unmotivated. Perhaps they are lazy. Or perhaps they just simply have a different life philosophy. They have a different outlook in life. And God allows us to experience different types of people so that we will know how to deal with them, yes, but how we look upon them. You know, I was in BGC this week uh, at the Ford area for some speaking engagements and had the opportunity to walk up and down High Street, if you're familiar with that uh, pedestrian area. The BGC area is certainly a very different crowd that walks around here in Quezon City. I was surprised to see a lot of pampered pets. They were all so well-groomed and like the stray dogs and cats we have around this area. In fact, as I was walking along High Street, I saw a maid, a nanny, pushing a buggy. And I peeked in to see what I wanted to see, a cute baby. But instead, looking back at me, were two small dogs. And I said, what comfort. And apparently, I found out in this area, uh, the maid, uh, the house helper, apparently earns at least 25,000 pesos a month or more. More than what a bank teller makes. I thought to myself, maybe I should apply for a job like this. But I thought this is crazy. What type of people are these who spend more money on their pets than on other human beings? And if you look at the grooming places along High Street, you will notice that the haircut for pets are more expensive than the haircuts for human people. And of course, I begin to judge them. But I have to catch myself. It's none of my business what they do with their money. And perhaps if I had that type of, type of money and I love Ted so much, maybe I would give them that sort of special treatment. You see, when you encounter people who have a very different outlook on life, a different philosophy of life, how you respond to them is very telling of who you are. Jacob has traveled two weeks or more on this journey. His sense of accomplishing a great goal has been achieved. He's ready to go. He's ready to start a new life. And he meets a bunch of people who won't even bother to water the sheep because they're waiting for the others. There will be men and women that you encounter who are simply not like you in their thinking. They are not like you in their actions. They are not like you in their motivations. And they are not like you in their beliefs. And God allows us to encounter these people to learn the lesson of how we can patiently deal with them. How we can show compassion on them by putting ourselves in their shoes to see the perspective that they are coming from. But on the flip side, to see how we will also react, to see how it will affect us. Will we be drawn to their level? Will we succumb to their lack of trying and motivation? Will you allow others with a different life philosophy to bring you down and to change the very person of who you believe you are? 
you and I know there are many cases where there are siblings that work in the family business. Brothers or sisters, siblings, where one sibling is lazy and unmotivated, simply living off daddy and mommy's hard work. And then there is the other sibling who is on the get-go, wants to expand the business. And when you have two people with different philosophies like this, you know that there's going to be problems. And both will run to their older daddy or mommy and say, look at the other one. Why are they like that? Now the reason I bring up this experience as something we need to understand is because at the root of the issue is the issue of conformity. How we respond in a situation or a context where people are different from you tells us a lot about ourselves. Specifically in application to our spiritual lives. Do you and I have a conviction to do what needs to be done to stand firm on what the Word of God says? You know, it's very easy to be a Christian when you are a church. It's very easy to live a Christ-like life when you are surrounded by Christians. But the toughest thing to be is to be a Christian, to live out a Christ-like life when you are surrounded by people who are not the same as you with the same belief. And that's why if you shelter yourself away from the world too much, you won't be able to figure out where your convictions stand. Will someone else's differing opinion change your perspective? Because when we encounter and experience different people, it shows us how strongly we are rooted in the faith. When people differ from you, do you have the compassion and the patience to want to reach them for Jesus Christ, to share with them the good news? Different types of people that we encounter is good for us. It shouldn't be a shock to us. And through that experience of interacting with them, not only should it solidify our faith, but it should teach us on how we can love upon them. I hope, men and women, that when you meet different types of people, specifically when they are different in their beliefs, that you and I will be found to be able to stand strongly in what the Word of God says. Look at verse 9 to 11. Now while Jacob was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. Rachel comes with her flock of sheep, and Jacob does not wait for the other flocks to arrive. He himself rolled the stone from the well. Apparently one person could do it. He isn't Samson with superhuman strength. And he waters the sheep of Rachel. He is so overjoyed to see family. Notice how the Bible emphasizes Laban, his mother's brother, three times. This is family. And he kissed Rachel as friends would do and as is appropriate in that culture. And begins to weep and cry. He's so overjoyed to finally meet family. He can feel safe now. He is at home. And he cries because there's an emotional release. Perhaps after a very tense two weeks of journeying, he is now at home. He can feel safe once again. Verse 12. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him. And embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So Jacob told Laban all these things. Jacob told Rachel who he was and she in turn runs and tells her father. And Laban is so excited that this is Rachel's son. That he comes out to meet Jacob and hugs and kisses him and welcomes him to his home. 
Jacob told his uncle the circumstances of why he's there. And look what Laban says in verse 14. And Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And Jacob stayed with Laban for a month. Laban is saying, You are one of us. You are warmly welcomed here. This is home. Jacob stayed for a month. If you remember from a few weeks ago, Jacob was only supposed to stay a few days until Esau's anger subsided, remember? Jacob was only expecting to be there a few days. But days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into a month. And months, as we're going to see, will turn into years. But at this time, Jacob has stayed a month. Why does the Bible tell us this at this point? Because Jacob feels very welcomed. Let me ask you something. If a good friend of yours comes and tells you, friend, I'm going through some difficulties in life. Can I stay in your house for a few days? I think most of us would be like, okay, let me help you out. Come and stay in my house for a few days. Most of us would be very welcoming if it's only a few days. But what if the same friend came and told you, friend, I'm going through some difficulties in life. Can I stay with you a few months? Um, Let me think about it would probably be the response. But in the back of your mind, you've already said, no, it's not going to happen. Or we'll say something like, well, let me ask my wife. Put the blame on her when you say no. To show hospitality for a few days is very different from showing hospitality for a month or so. But the Bible tells us he stayed with Laban for a month. You knew that there was genuine welcome, which is what Jacob experienced. And that's the second experience that God allows us to experience. Number two, the experience of a warm welcome and hospitality extended. A warm welcome and hospitality extended. There are times in life when God will allow you and me to experience being warmly welcomed where you receive undeserved hospitality, grace. It is shown and showered upon you. And how does it make you feel? It makes you feel wonderful. You feel safe. You feel God's love to the person or the family who extends this welcome. You say, this is grace. But as you experience it, Applicationally, it is also to remind us that we are also to extend the same Christian welcome and hospitality to others. This is a principle spoken of throughout the scriptures, specifically in the New Testament. Remember what Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 13? Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. This experience should be what pervades the body of Christ, the church. In this place, there should be a warm welcome and an extending of gracious hospitality. Because you and I have felt the pain of being alone. When no one pays attention to us, where we're off in the corner by ourselves, just hoping that someone would notice us, hoping that someone would acknowledge that we are there and that we exist. But why is it that when we notice people like this, even in the church, we just walk right on by? How does it make you feel if you were the one that had no friends at church and knew no one and received no welcome? A Christ-like life is extending a warm welcome and hospitality to your various circles of community and in our own church community. Look around. The person sitting next to you may be coming to church for the first time or they may have come for a few weeks and this is the last weekend that they will give GCCP a try. They have resolved that if no one greets me or welcomes me this week, then I'm going to try another church. My friends, let it not be so. If you have experienced a a warm welcome 
and has had hospitality extended to you, you and I have a responsibility as followers of Christ to return the favor. When the all volcano exploded and many flights were canceled for a few days, my missionary friend on her way back to Mexico was stranded. She was at the airport not knowing anyone. Surrounding hotels were booking up fast and I was out of reach, out of town. And she contacted me and I asked one of our church members to help try to secure a room at one of the local airport hotels. He was able to get a reservation and secure a room. And to my surprise, he took care of the accommodations for the next few days. My friend felt very welcomed and cared for. On the day when the flights were canceled in the chaos of the airport, she ran into a missionary flying to Malaysia, also stranded and not knowing anyone in Manila. My friend invited her to stay with her in the room as a way of also extending hospitality. And both of them were able to fly out of Manila five days later. The friend going to Malaysia, who I didn't know, said she wouldn't have known what to do and most probably would have lived at the airport for a few nights because finances were limited. But both now have a wonderful impression of our grace community because of just one act of welcome and hospitality. The reason God allows us to experience the hospitality of others is so that we can extend it to others as believers in Jesus Christ. Look at verses 15 to 17. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Apparently, Jacob was working for Laban for free. That month he was staying with him. And Laban says, Jacob, you shouldn't work for free. How can I pay you back? And the Bible tells us Laban has two daughters, Leah and Rachel. Both were beautiful. Leah's eyes are described as being delicate, tender. She was kind-hearted, tender-hearted. She was beautiful in that way. But Rachel was the bombshell. She was physically attractive. She would be the one that won the beauty contest if there was one between the two. Look at verse 18. Now Jacob loved Rachel. He said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel. Note this. And they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Perhaps Jacob remembered what his father Isaac had instructed him, that he take a wife from his hometown. And so he agreed to work for Laban for seven years without salary if Laban would give Rachel to be his wife in exchange for service rendered. The Bible tells us those seven years went by very quickly as of only a few days because Jacob was so in love smitten by the beautiful Rachel. Love was in the air. And God allowed Jacob, number three, to experience being in love. The experience of being in love. Love is a wonderful thing. It motivates you to do things you wouldn't normally think about doing. Imagine Loving someone so much that you would work seven years without salary just to marry the woman you love. Did any of you do that? If that was proposed to you, the one you are married to today, if when you were still dating, the father-in-law said, you can marry my daughter, but you have to work for me for seven years without salary, would you have done it? Well, the correct answer is yes, because you're married to her. Even if you lie, the answer is yes. But that would certainly give you a secondary pause 
Seven years without salary? I love her, but maybe not that much. That's seven Christmases. That's 84 months. That's 364 weeks. But you know, when people are in love, they do crazy stuff. And Jacob says, I'll work for you for free for seven years for the privilege of marrying your daughter. Are there lessons to learn when we experience being in love? Absolutely, there are a lot. There are lessons that love teach us, such as learning to be patient, learning to sacrifice. But on the flip side, there are wonderful lessons that serve as a warning for us. Because when we are in love, we are often blinded in that love. And the feeling of love will make us do things we normally wouldn't do. That's why it's important, the Bible tells us, to guard our hearts. I had the opportunity to speak at our high school fellowship uh, this past Friday. Their theme in the month of February was about what it means to guard one's heart. It's sometimes a nebulous concept. What does it mean to guard one's heart? And I spoke about how the Word of God is a way by which we guard our hearts. Because you know the saying, the heart wants what the heart wants. But what if the heart wants something that is wrong? That's why it's important to have guidelines and guardrails to ensure that the heart wants what God wants, especially when in love. Because we all know people who make very dumb and foolish decisions because they are so blinded by love without any guidelines or guardrails that the Bible establishes. That's why, my friends, especially if you're single this morning, when you are going to choose a life partner, make sure you have input from family and close friends who know you the best, who pray for you, and who love you enough to tell you the truth. You see, if someone were to advise Jacob, maybe they would have advised Jacob not to pick Rachel. They may have advised Jacob to pick Leah instead. Someone who is sweet and tender and kind. Because someone needs to remind Jacob that outward beauty is fleeting. And just as a side note, my own perspective about this, I wonder, and we'll talk about this in a few weeks, if Jacob comes to the realization much later in life that maybe he should have picked Leah first over Rachel. Because as the Bible tells us, It is Leah who gets buried with Jacob at Kirat Arba, while Rachel gets buried on the side of the road on the way to Bethlehem. Now, we don't want to read too much into love as it relates to who gets buried where. But it says a lot when it is Leah that is buried with Jacob and Rachel is not. But we'll talk about it when we get there in a few weeks. That's why the Word of God plays such an important part in guarding our hearts. To make sure that love doesn't cause us to do foolish things. Because it takes our focus away on what's right. Where reality is skewed. Imagine seven years as if only a few days he was certainly in love. That's why when we are blinded by love and in love... The Bible tells us in Psalm 119, verse 105, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. When you and I don't have our heads on straight because we're so in love, at least the path is clearly marked so that we don't stumble and fall. I ate at a Japanese restaurant this week with a friend who invited me for a meal. A wonderful time of fellowship and food. Anyway, we ended the meal, and it was time to go. And whoever was the interior designer of this Japanese restaurant, I believe, had not thought through all of the safety aspects of this restaurant. Because uh, there was a curtain, a heavy curtain, that separated the restaurant from the lobby. And of course, as I was walking out, I would have to leave the restaurant, open the curtains, and walk through to the lobby to my car. And, you know, whenever you place a a curtain where you can't see the other side, you would expect that when you design the interior, that 
the pathway would be even. That when you walk through the curtains, it would be the same height. But the way to design this restaurant is when you open the curtain and you take that first step through the curtain, it is a drop down. I didn't know this. So I opened the curtain and I took one step. And you know that feeling, it just strikes you at that second. When that feet comes down and you don't land on the walkway, you realize, I'm about to fall. But what can you do? You've already taken that step. Your, your body weight has shifted. And I realize that I better prepare myself in that split second to catch my fall. But I assume that I should be okay because when you miss a step, you know, you take a few more steps forward to balance yourself. And I know it's hard to imagine, but I used to be an athlete once and uh, I could figure this out. So I took that step into the air and I prepared to catch my fall. But you know, the interior designer decided that it would be very nice that at the lobby, instead of an even service, even though it's one step below, that they would have the flooring as uneven large slabs of rocks to simulate old Japan. So when my feet planted itself on the step below, it planted itself on the side of one of the protruding rocks. All right, And of course, I twist my ankle and I fall. And that also split second, I prepared myself that this 240 pound body is going to hit that ground hard. But thankfully, God provided a 140 pound waitress to cushion my fall. (laughs) Because you know when you're about to fall, you instinctively just try to grab onto something. (laughs) Now the fact that I can walk up here and preach to you today means I'm okay. She seemed okay when I left. (laughs) But uh, what an experience. (laughs) But as I thought about this, I said, this is so true. It is the same when we experience love. There's an English idiom, idiom, you fall head over heels over someone, right? You literally trip yourself to do foolish things. But sadly, you get hurt in the process That's what happens when you experience being in love when you don't have the safeguards of the Word of God, when you don't have spiritual advisors who speak truth into your life. You will fall head over heel and hurt yourself emotionally and spiritually and physically. But when you experience a love that is so deep and yet it is boundaried, by the guidelines of scripture, then you can enjoy the experience of being in love, not worried that the path is uneven. But even though the curtain blinds you from seeing what the next part is, you realize that when you step through, it's still an even path. If you have time, read in the book of Judges about the story of Samson and Delilah and how she uses him being so in love with her to destroy him. The experience of being in love. What lessons will you learn from it? What warnings can you learn from it as well? Look at verse 21 to 25 with me. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled that I may go into her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? The seven years have passed. Jacob wants to collect. And Laban throws him a wedding. That evening in the darkness of the tents. And customarily as the women would be veiled. Jacob didn't know that Laban had given Leah to him instead of Rachel as his wife. In the morning after the marriage had been consummated and therefore legal. 
Jacob furiously told Laban, why have you deceived me? Look at Laban's response in verse 26. And Laban said, it must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Can you imagine what Jacob must have been feeling? That Laban comes up with this rather lame excuse that it was the culture of the people of his country that the older must marry before the younger. You don't think that Jacob was thinking in his mind, and you couldn't have told me this little but very important fact over the course of seven years, 84 months, 364 weeks. It never came to your mind to tell me this important fact. And you can almost imagine the interaction between Jacob and Laban. Perhaps Laban's pathetic reply, oops, I forgot. Jacob had been deceived, manipulated, and he cries out, why have you deceived me? But it hearkens us a few chapters back when we remember that Jacob does the same thing to his father Isaac. You see, it is no fun when you go through, number four, the experience of being deceived and taken advantage of. The experience of being deceived and taken advantage of. It's not a great feeling when the shoe is on the other foot. A lesson learned for Jacob. In the bigger applicational picture, it is to remind us to make sure that we don't take advantage of others, that we don't deceive others, because we don't have the moral foundation to say it's unfair when someone is taking advantage of us when we do the same. That biblical truth, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So when we experience it ourselves and we realize how terrible it is and how it makes us feel, it should deter us from doing the same to others. There is great pain. And that pain of going through being deceived and being taken advantage of should not elicit an attitude of revenge, but one where you choose to say, I won't do this to others. You can almost imagine how sorry Jacob must feel for himself. We feel sorry for him. That is a cruel cruel punishment, cruel deception. You have worked seven years without salary, and I give you someone else. And can you imagine in Jacob's mind, my own uncle, my own family, it always hurts the most when it is your own family who takes advantage of you and deceives you. It hurts the most. How will you respond when you and I undergo an experience being taken advantage of, how do we respond? Will Christ's likeness boil to the surface? Or will thoughts of revenge come into play? Verse 27 to 30. Laban says, fulfill her week and we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve with me still another seven years. Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. So he gave him his daughter Rachel as wife also. And Laban gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as a maid. Then Jacob also went in to Rachel and he also loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Laban still another seven years. Laban tells Jacob You serve with me another seven years for free and I will give you Rachel. Not even a discount on the number of years. This Laban is quite manipulative. Which Jacob agrees. Waits for seven days before marrying Rachel. And actually Jacob got married for a second time within eight days. But now he is to work another seven years to have the wife that he wanted in the first place. What an experience. But notice that Jacob doesn't fight back. We are a bit surprised. Simply resigned to the fact that he was taken advantage of and quietly works another seven years. Here's the fifth experience. Number five, the experience of going through adversity and accepting it. The experience of going through adversity and learning to accept it. 
you would think that Jacob would have told Rachel, hey, Rachel, once we get married, we can run away after a year or six months. But somehow Jacob is resigned that he wants to hold his end of the bargain. And even though he was taken advantage of, even though he could have said, well, Laban did this to me, I'll do this back to him. The Bible tells us he works and serves with Laban still another seven years. My friends, we all go through adversities in life. In fact, there are much studies that tell us what type of quotients are needed for a person to be successful. I'm sure you've heard of this. For years, many people said, to be successful, you need to have a high IQ, an intelligent quotient. You must be smart. You need to know a lot of facts and information, and that's true. But then after a few years, a psychologist came back and said, no, you must also have an EQ, an emotional quotient that is high, where you are able to deal healthily with the emotions of others and of yourself. And an IQ and an EQ coming together will have and make a successful person. But then a few years later, the sociologists and the psychologists come back and say, no, you must also cultivate a very high SQ, what we call a sociability quotient. Your ability to make friends and keep friends will make you a successful person working alongside with the IQ and the EQ. And there are a lot of other cues, but right now the rage is talking about having an AQ, the adversity quotient. The ability to be able to handle adversities, to have a high IQ, to have a high EQ, to have a high SQ is not enough. You must also have a high AQ. That is what will build successful people, men and women who are able to handle the problems of life, to accept it and to learn from it. My friends, this is not a modern psychological realization. The Bible talks about this 2,000 years ago. That the Lord takes us through trials and adversities to mold us, to toughen us, to strengthen us, to teach us lessons. Remember the book of James? We did an expositional study of it a few years ago. James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, James writes to the churches, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Imagine that. You and I will go through adversities instead of complaining about it. Count it all joy that you go through these things because it is to make you a better person. And then James writes in verse 12 of chapter 1, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Those who have a very high AQ, the Bible tells us, those who go through adversities will be able to receive a reward from God. Those who persevere through adversities will receive the crown of life. And so with this truth in mind, perhaps, our prayer should reflect this. Maybe our prayers focus too much on praying that the Lord will get rid of adversities in our life. Lord, the hardships of my life that I'm going through, it's so unfair. Lord, would you just take away my problems, take away my hardships? However hard it is, maybe our prayer should be, Lord, help me to learn the lessons that you want me to learn that the adversity of my life is bringing me. Open up my eyes, open up my mind, open up my heart to be able to accept and learn the lesson that you want me to learn that the adversity of life brings Because you and I know that we will meet many people in this journey called life who uses deception and intrigue and trickery and schemes to make our lives hard. They are out there and they will make up reasoning for why it is justified. You will experience in your life, 
in the business world where you don't get your fair share. You will experience in your life the adversity of having a sickness that doesn't seem to be cured even if you've prayed fervently. You will experience in your life the adversity of having your heart broken in love, wrenched. You've been going out with someone for so long and and they just break your heart. And so, can it be how hard as it is for us to say, Lord, you've allowed me to go through these experiences. Help me to learn the lesson to draw closer to you, to trust in you more, to make me more spiritually mature. It is surprising that Jacob does not fight back when he is the fighter. I believe he doesn't fight back and argue with Laban because of the experience we talked about two weeks ago when he met God at Bethel. When he saw that God would always be with him and that promised to bring him back to his homeland with great blessings. However uncertain Jacob must have felt about how God was orchestrating everything Jacob understood that he had to go through these things to be able to experience what God has promised. We who know the end of the story, we know it does happen. But at that moment, to have such faith, wow, that is a lesson learned. You can only imagine Paul's cry for prayer as God gave him a thorn in the flesh. And we're not sure what that is, but it so hurt Paul, the apostle, that the apostle Paul prayed three times for the Lord to remove it, and he doesn't. And finally, Paul just gives up in a sense, and he says, Lord, in my weakness, your strength will be perfected. So I will boast in my weakness so that I can boast more about you. When men and women understand the lessons that can be learned when one goes through adversity and accept it. It will mature you very quickly in the spiritual things. You will then learn what it means to have faith in God and to trust in Him. When you and I come to the acknowledgement that it is to my benefit, our benefit, that God brings us through times of adversities so that we can be transformed Not only to be a better person, but to be more Christ-like with a reward at the end. And if you and I can't imagine wanting to go through these experiences and seeing any good that comes out of it, look no further than Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God Himself, who experienced all of these things when He walked amongst us and yet did not sin Jesus experienced meeting people who had a very different outlook in life. So different, in fact, that they rejected him, even his own family. Jesus was taken advantage of by people in his inner circle and those around him and the outside. Jesus accepted the adversity he had to endure, which was to walk the path of Calvary And we see a bit of that struggle in his prayer in Gethsemane. But he was willing to accept that adversity because he was so in love with us, so in love with mankind that he extended this gracious act of hospitality to sinners like you and me. Of all the things that Jesus could do you can say he was so in love that he would do what we wouldn't do that he who knew no sin would become sin for all of us and walk the path of Calvary with arms stretched out just to show how much he loves us to accept us for who we are 
that by placing our trust in him, we have eternal life. We would wonder why Jesus would do such a thing. And we know it is because of his love. Love causes us and caused him to do things that we normally wouldn't think is logical. And so if Jesus can endure these experiences which gave for us eternal life, how much more can we see that the experience God brings us in our life is to achieve a better person in us, to learn to be more Christ-like in our character, in our action, to be able to see a greater purpose in the experiences that we go through. My friends, I hope you will be able to see that as you go through life. That you will be able to see God's greater purpose even though you don't understand it completely. But you see it is for your good. Because the teacher called experience is a wonderful teacher that draws us closer to Jesus Christ if we allow it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for experiences that we go through, all of them. I certainly am not happy all the time with the things that come about in my life. But help me, Lord, to look through the lenses with a heavenly mindset to see that you are at work, that what I go through is for your glory and for my good. But it takes the work of the Holy Spirit to get me to that point. So Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit at this moment would do the work of conviction to allow all who are here this morning to see the greater purpose that adversities and experiences bring in our life. Grow us spiritually and in maturity as we learn to love you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.